I'd like to welcome you to a series of sermons, which I'm calling Pauses on the Path to Christmas. Four pauses, all based on the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Today, the story of Zechariah. Next week, the Annunciation to Mary. The third week, the visitation between Mary and Elizabeth. And finally, back to Zechariah again. So let's listen to this passage. And one of the things that I'm going to suggest that we use our imagination. Our imagination is not a pretend faculty that we have. It's the faculty that allows us to penetrate beyond the here and now in a limited temporal sense of the word or spatial and moves us into what is something that is eternal. So when we're hearing this gospel about Zechariah, we're going to be aware that we also are like him. We can identify with him. And while we're going to preach in the sermon in that direction, I'm going to leave it to you to do more work on that in the quiet of your days this week. I'm beginning with the fifth verse of the first chapter of Luke. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. So there's the setting. In the Gospel of Luke and in the Acts, the only time that the word blameless is used is this with regard to Elizabeth and Zechariah. They were blameless. They did all the right things. And now we're going to hear what happens when Zechariah, it's his turn to come into the Holy of Holies. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the autumn celebration. It's Yom Kippur. And by lot, he was the group to go in, but by lot, the one from that group was selected by lot was Zechariah. So you've got to get appreciate the picture. He's been waiting all his life for this moment to go into the Holy of Holies. There's even a story that the person that goes into the Holy of Holies has a rope tied around his waist with a bell, just in case he gets really, really caught up and faints and pays out. They could drag him out. So he's in there. As we're going to see in this narrative, he doesn't expect what's going to happen to Elizabeth or to him, not in the slightest way. He's just coming in to fulfill his duty in the generic no-frills hope that the Messiah will come, that liberation will come, that freedom will come. So he's there. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by Lot according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. We don't use incense here, but we have different candles and things that are fragrant. So just kind of picture in your mind the burning of incense there in that inner space. When the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So he's got support. He's got people that are there with him. They're waiting when it's all over, when he'll come out, and he will give the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face to shine upon you. And be gracious unto you, and so forth. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled 
and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of the birth, for he will be great in the sight of God. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. So he starts out by being frightened. And after this beautiful, powerful, visionary expression of Gabriel, he's got only one thing in his mind. Not possible. Yeah, not possible. My wife is too old, beyond childbearing age, period. End of full story. Full stop. How can this be? How can I be sure? He wants some verification. I'm an old man, and my wife is well on in years. He forgets about Abraham and Sarah, not thinking about Rachel and Jacob. He's not thinking about people that were on the edge in which God intervened. This is a moment of God's intervention. It's a moment for you in which God is intervening in a way to loosen the hold that may be happening in you that prevents you from experiencing God within. Carl Jung said that when we put God outside us, like I'm here, God's there, it's the beginning of a loss of faith, he said. It's got to be inside, inside. There's an ancient uh, Hindu poet by the name of Kabir from the 15th century that imagines us asking a fish in the water, are you thirsty? And the fish laughs back. My brothers and sisters, we are swimming in the presence of God. We're swimming in it. We can't get out of it. That's the beauty of this season, to awaken us to a deeper experience by faith, using our imagination, using all the gifts that God is giving to us so that we can enter into the awareness that the Lord has indeed come. Even though we say, oh, come, oh, come, we want God to come deeper into ourselves because we're the ones that were opaque. I love that bumper sticker that says, if God seems far away, guess who moved? Guess who moved? So it's the season to become aware of the indwelling of the Lord. So the angel continues the conversation. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So Zechariah is forced to shut up. If you can't be open and open and awaken to this truth, then you need to be quiet. And forced quiet was mute. Not a bad suggestion for us. As we so easily can offer our opinions or our point of view, 
when we're not even asked to do that. It's sort of a reaction. We just want to jump in and give it right away. What would it be like for you, before you speak, to be quiet, to be silent, to process what it is coming into your ears and into your heart that would have you react in a way that could disturb the flow of conversation that you'd like to have with those close to you, or even the brief greetings with folks in the supermarket. It's really good to be quiet. The season of darkness, which is Advent, is also a season of silence. It's difficult when we go shopping to have silence with all the music and the things that are rattling around. That's good. Who wants to be a, 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 a naysayer about the preparations that we're culturally accustomed to? The gift giving. Don't want to nay, naysay that. But it just means that we need to find some quiet time to be really still and get in touch by faith with what's going on inside. By suggesting that we do this by imagination, it doesn't lend itself right now for an extended time of meditation. But during the week, go back to this reading. The word of God endures forever. The word of God is outside of time because it's inside you. We really are meant to live outside time. This was the moment. There's two words in Greek that talk about time. One is chronos, chronology. The other is kairos. It's the moment of opportunity. It's the moment when Tiffany was surprised by her dad coming from Florida to visit her. Oh, the bright joy of that. The gatherings over Thanksgiving weekend. It, it's, it's what brings the brightness to it. And we want to just feel that lift, feel that upward surge from within us that allows us to experience the joy that's meant to exist in this season. A joy that penetrates through our darkness, through our controversies, through our politics. It just pierces right through all of that. So meanwhile, people were waiting outside for Zechariah to come out and give the blessing. That's what they usually do. He comes outside. It'd be like me, I'm not going to give the blessing at the end. Uh, <laughs> doesn't happen. The people were waiting outside and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. They were watching their watches if they had them, wondering, what's taking him so long? When he came out, he could not speak to them. He could not give to them what they were waiting for, that traditional blessing from the sixth chapter of Numbers. They realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. What are, the, what are the signs? Picture in your mind. What was he doing to try to tell? What was he doing to tell the people, something happened, I can't talk about it, but they knew. They knew Zechariah had been touched. And they knew that God was going to do what God was going to do despite the unbelief of Zechariah. God's going to do it because he said he would do it. And he did it. He did it. So all of these Advent readings that we're going to have, and they're designed, by the way, by St. Luke, to be prefiguring what the rest of the gospel is going to be like. The gospel of peace. A gospel in which there's a focus on women. A gospel that's dedicated to the poor. We'll see that when we come to the, to the Magnificat in a few weeks. We see all of this happening because we're invited to enter the mainstream of all of these graces so that we can experience a fresh, new experience of God. God's waiting for us to jump into the water rather than flop around outside like fish that have been caught, losing their context, their ambience, their setting. We are in the presence of God. 
When his time for service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. It was thought to be a kind of curse if a woman didn't have a child. And that's where she thought she was heading. I guess I'm not finding favor with God. All these years, no pregnancy. And finally, it happens. She knows it happens because she is pregnant. She couldn't deny that. The two names, Elizabeth and Zechariah, have nice meanings to them. The word Elizabeth in Hebrew means God is an oath. Think of it as God is promise. God is going to do what God is going to do. The reign of God, as we celebrated at the end of the kingdom tide season, the reign of God is here permanently. It's within us. And then the, the name Zechariah means God or Yahweh remembers. God does not forget. God forgets our sins, but he never forgets his promise. I pray that all of us in this special season, and please go further, take this same reading again. Be like Zechariah. Imagine you're Zechariah. Even stand up or kneel up close to him. Ask him a question. What's it like to be here? Let your imagination, because Zechariah lives, the saints live, the spirit lives. So plug into that by the use of the faculties that God has given you and me to be able to access these mysteries and believe in them fully. We may have times of doubt and struggle. It's not meant to be crystal clear. God's patient with our doubts and with our confusions and with our struggles. But God is going to stay faithful to you. And when you find yourself being discouraged or lonely or depressed or whatever it is that your brain is telling the rest of you to think and do, go under the deep waves and let the presence of God speak to your heart, even in that silence. You may not, it may not come out in words, but it comes out in an interior sense that God is with you, that God loves you. Your time and God's time have beautifully come together.